Just got back from China and boy am I tired. There's no joke there, it's just the truth. I think, are we both jet lagged? Just slightly, maybe. Um, I'm gonna say yes. I, I was up later than I should have been and then I slept in a disastrous, nightmarish dream world. This is pretty much what it's like flying back from Asia. The entire flight, everyone on, everyone does that just all the time. All the time on the flight. Never stops. Anyway, <laughs> it's been a while. We've got a lot of it, really interesting footage. And I also want to say this before we get started. Um, Galax did not sponsor this video. We've been sponsored by you know for several different videos. They did not sponsor this video. Uh, we, we went and checked out their overclocking event. Their uh, Hall of Fame card broke like 15 world records, mostly in the canned benchmark, uh, but it's the benchmark that everyone uses to set the you know the standard for what's the, the fastest graphics card. They broke like 15 world records. And the thing that I found them to be the most compelling is, is talking to the actual overclockers. And we've got a video coming up on this as soon as I get it finished uh, as far as the editing goes. Talking to the individual overclockers and finding out what they had to say about the different companies, not just Galax, was very interesting. Like uh, the main guy, Daniel, he's from Germany, and he won all all the overclocking stuff. Uh, at the very last minute, he lost one, which was brought a tear to his eye. But. Yeah, but he pretty, much, he pretty much won everything else. I think someone else beat him out in the single card performance, which yeah. is impressive. Um, anyway, I was asking him about different companies, and he, he was saying that um, he uses Asus for, mostly for his motherboards, but he has not found anything that comes close to the Hall of Fame uh, quality cards. And he's talking about from a, a retail standpoint. He said that a lot of the other companies will give you a really nice card, like a cherry card, if you call them up and say, like, hey, can you send me a card? But if you go to, re you know, go to the retail uh, outlet and grab the exact same card, it'll, it, it, there's, it'll not even be close. Yeah, so he said that the, the prime pickings off. Yeah. So he said that with the Hall of Fame cards, you could just go and grab one, and it'll it'll perform really well. And I was like, okay, that's freaking compelling. So I didn't realize how big this company was. They're like the biggest in China, uh, and they make some really nice stuff. And I mean, they broke 15 world records while we were there. I was like, this is huge. I mean, it felt pretty cool being the only Western media there as well. So cool and the cards, oddly the cards fun. that I've tested, uh, I was very impressed by. Like, legitimately, actually. Uh, very, very impressive cards. I wish they would, I mean, me personally, I wish they would tone down the aesthetic, but in terms of like how overclocking or how overclockable it is and how much fun I had doing terrible, terrible things to it because it was like, I'm going to just do terrible things to this card. I'm going to flash the BIOS. I'm going to overvolt it. I don't care. Yeah. It was really good. Yeah, a lot of people were flashing the, the, the BIOS while we were there. I was, I was you know, walking by and looking at people. I was like, what are they doing in DOS? Oh, they're you know, in whatever they're flashing the BIOS. That's what they're doing. So yeah, pretty interesting time. Uh, stay tuned for those videos. They'll be coming up very soon. Also, I have a really big photography uh, tutorial coming up, and uh, it's a pretty big video. Anyway, let's go ahead and mess with this guy's house. This is up in uh, Alaska. I'm going to turn on that tree right there. Uh, while we're watching this, I just want to make note that this, uh, unless we upload something else before this, uh, mm -hmm. this is our 1,000th video. Neat. Mm -hmm. I just want to point that out. I never celebrate those things. I know. That's why I'm celebrating it. Oh, With Christmas lights that you can turn on and off via the web. You guys can go there and turn that on and off if you like. It's in Fairbanks, Alaska. Mm -hmm. All right. So so uh, Toyota or Ford or whoever this is. I'm really tired. I've already forgotten. Ford. <laughs> this is Toyota. Uh, Ford has decided to make a car that uh, transforms into a... Well, it, says, it says motorcycle. This It is a motorized unicycle. It, yeah, who wrote this uses, article? Wow. They, also, they also likened it to Batman. This is nothing like any of that stuff. This is bad journalism. You have to take one of your tires off, but at least there's a jack built in that allows you to do this. You have to like... They're like, okay, here, I'm going to catch the bad guys. They went down that alleyway. Hold on just a minute. And Let you me. pull over, and you push, put the jack down, and you're like, oh, I'm going to get you in just a second and take off your tire, put it on a unicycle. Then you got to put on your clown outfit, <laughs> and then you can chase the bad guys down. So, so that's this how is this the, works. This is, this is the, the Joker's car when he decides <laughs> to dress up like Batman or vice versa. Hmm, hold on just one second. I'm going to go ahead and uh, get my green unicycle out. What I thought was interesting about this, uh, the, the paragraph on here, is that it, it doesn't actually say Batman. It just says the, the movie. The headline says Batman. It says, oh, that's here, I Batmo that part. Like right here, Batmobile, motorcycle, blockbuster movie, 
Like all this shit. Is oh yeah, in the, see, like, that is way too long. I don't even read that. My, SEO. My, this my, guy is an SEO master. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to see this as a slightly different implementation. Maybe you know, like those hoverboards, which is like the Segway without the stick. Maybe mm-hmm. one of those, but like a version of those that looks like truck nuts until you take it off and then it's a hoverboard. <laughs> I've I'm, I'm never thought in my life I'd hear a sentence that said, you know, <laughs> things that look like, it looks like truck nuts, but it's actually a hoverboard. <laughs> I, don't you know, think, I don't know. It's, it would probably work. I mean, you take it off and, you know, you can, <laughs> you can get around right, that way. I mean, I don't know. All right, what is this? Wendell just sent us a thing here. Um... So I'm going to get a patent on this. This is going to be in the trunk, and the way that it works is you open the trunk, and then it escapes. <laughs> and then it Look escapes. It, it is designed to escape. Yeah, and then it's it Thomas clears the Thomas the Tank Engine crime-fighting robot. Wow. This is going to be abused by law enforcement. <laughs> <laughs> All right, speaking of things that will uh, appeal to children, yet also harm them, let's talk about... Only their balloons. It's going to jump out of the car. It's going to march down the street. And it's going to find that kid with his birthday balloon. Yay, I got a pop. You ruined my segue. It's going to blind somebody. Because if it can pop a balloon, it can definitely fry your retina. You ruined my segue. Actually, I think he improved it, to be perfectly honest with you. (laughs) Back back to where I was here. Oh, there's that thing. Um, So, kids are really susceptible to... (laughs) Games. Technically, we're trying to improve upon the Segway's design. <laughs> <laughs> this is show. Why do we even do it anymore? <laughs> I'm sorry. I was a little late with that. I'm sorry. You know, that was. I mean, that was the thing with the hoverboard, right? That improves on the Segway by not having the pole. That's why it's popular. Mm-hmm. Also, burns people's houses down. <laughs> if you're just joining us, you're watching Truck Nuts Live. Um, <laughs> Pretty much. So, I don't even like trucks. (laughs) I like peanuts. It's a really great comic strip. Okay, another movie coming out, right, or something? Okay, so what what is this article about? I've already forgotten. So, the kids when they watch things that have embedded advertisements, no, no, this is or play games that have embedded advertisements. This is actually talking about games that were created. that are advertisements. Right. But the kids don't know that they're advertisements. Children Did have you know that distinguishing between things that are advertisements and things that are content and older stuff and stuff like this exploits the whole authority figure and basic psychological tricks to convince children that they need to buy toys or pester their parents into buying toys or whatever. It's funny, in this article it says that kids who uh, played games or something that featured lots of candy were hungrier afterwards. It was like 67% of them needed snacks like right after that. Uh, and it was especially worse if the kid was already fat. So fat kids playing games that have feature food. No, no, no. Like I said, this specifically, this is these are games that are advertisements. So I, I, this is yeah. like Kit Kat Tetris. Well, yeah, but I, I, they were just saying in, in general. Oh, in general? Oh, that's yeah, yeah. even worse. Yeah, like games that have like candy and soda pop. Like there's, there are some games out there where like you know your power ups are candy and soda pop and so pizza. So Candy Crush is the work of the devil. Well, we already knew that, but this is further proof that it is the Illuminati Satan conspiracy. This was actually really bad in the fifties and sixties. I think it was so bad that the government threatened to get involved, and so the ad industry was like, "All right, all right, we'll tone it down." And the toned down stuff is what you see in like He Man and Transformers, which were cartoons that were designed to sell toys. The only reason those cartoons existed, literally, was to sell toys. And that was the toned-down version. So you can, I mean, there are, there are advertisements from the 1950s and 1960s where there's like a general or a policeman or some authority figure that's literally telling children, you need to go tell your parents you need to buy this right now because this toy is amazing and you're just going to do all this really cool stuff and you're just, you know, <laughs> it's going to be really bad if you don't buy this. And children were like, okay, that sounds good. And it... Parents were sort of noticing and getting annoyed, and so the government threatened to get involved, and the, the ad industry said, oh, no, we'll, we'll regulate it. It'll be fine. And thus was born He-Man. Yep. But, but He-Man, it's like... Mattel it, wanted it to It was so place. good. It was just so good. <laughs> was it, like, though? Was it really? Yeah, well, it was, it was so awful that it went, it, it went all the way back around to good. It's one of those things. It was so awful. 
I mean, Skeletor? Come on. A purple... Beast man! Yeah, that's... <laughs> And he wasn't it's, even the main bad guy. They kept having to invent new bad guys that were th- those bad guys. Triclops and, needed to sell more toys. Yeah, he's like, hmm. We need Triclops and Beast Man and a few other guys. And hmm, we need to be uh, doing this job and making more stuff to sell toys out of. But if we can make it bad enough, people will watch it. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> this is not a new thing for anyone out there being like, oh my god, I'm so appalled at what's happening with uh, uh, all these toys and apps for our children. It's been happening for a while. Hey, you can be appalled about it. That's good. That's great. Be appalled. But just don't think that it's like, they've invented a new way to screw us. Oh my God. No, they've been screwing you the same way for a while, but you've been numb to it. Yeah. You grew up with it being like bombarded and thrown down. I mean, how many G.I. Joes did you have? I, I hated mean, those things. It's the same thing. G.I. Yeah, Joe, Transformers, He-Man. Stuff was He-Man cool. uh, now, see, now this is where it gets interesting, because then you start getting into things like Ninja Turtles. Uh, the cartoon was designed to sell toys, but it was all inspired off of a comic book. Yeah, and the comic book is nothing like the cartoon. The comic book is dark and a little bit weird, and they're, they're more... Some of them are more sociopathic, even, I yeah, would say. Yeah, it was... They, they was the comic bloody, and there's the more murder, and... Yeah. I think the comic, the comic book's way better, yeah. More, more realistic if i was a it, it's more realistic with those t- teenage mutant ninja turtles and the aliens i like the aliens <laughs> much more realistic all right so let's talk about this uh global software piracy ring uh being in the tech industry i'm sure some of you guys have seen this out there you know some some of you guys have, have seen these gray market serial numbers and stuff floating around or or whatever but apparently there are five or six guys who have been convicted and pled guilty to selling uh, serial numbers from Adobe products, Microsoft products, and that sort of thing. Um, and it looks like they're making millions of dollars, but they've been selling them on everywhere. Overstock, Amazon.com, eBay. Microsoft creates, like, okay, there's pirated software, and then there's stuff that's not pirated software. And I would be really curious to know how much of it is pirated and how much of it is resold market segmentation. So, like, Microsoft knows that nobody in China is going to pay $90 for a copy of Windows. So they'll sell you a copy of Windows for $10, and it's completely legitimate. Now, free trade, this whole free trade agreement thing, means that there is nothing to stop me from importing a $10 copy of Windows into America. I should totally be able to do that legally. We could do that now with textbooks. There was actually a a case, at least in the U.S., that went all the way to the Supreme Court that said it was completely fine for medical students to import (laughs) textbooks from other countries that were sold at a cheaper rate. I mean, that's that's the whole point of capitalism. You buy low, you sell high. Should be allowed with operating systems, but Microsoft sort of gets around it and says, oh, this, is, this software is not allowed to operate in this region, and it's kind of a gray market area. It is sort of a, a gray thing. And the Adobe thing is the same way. Americans will pay $50 a month for the Adobe Creative Suite, but, you know, if you're somewhere yeah, else... Australians will Europe, pay twice you, that. You might pay. Yeah, Australians will pay twice that, depending on where you are in Europe. You yeah. might pay half that, but... You know, it is what it is, but these companies want to do market segmentation that is enforced by the law. That should not be allowed. But as far as piracy goes, they should be allowed to go after these people and, and get recompense. And so it's a very fine line. And I don't really like that Wired didn't mention or cover anything to do with the whole gray market thing. And so it's hard to know if these guys were actually running a piracy outfit or if they were actually, if some of that was not actually piracy because the controls especially in the adobe suite especially on windows have gotten very good i mean as invasive as those two programs are now they basically have your home address and know who you are so (laughs) it would be silly to pirate it anyway well uh this one here the the guys that have been arrested and and pled guilty uh it is they were blatantly pirating not only were they selling copies that were imported but they were selling the same key 10, 15 times. That's what got him in trouble. And Well, that's part of what they got him in trouble. One of the other ones that got him in trouble is one of the guys was uh, selling these things on eBay Mm -hmm. and then did this all under a not-for-profit organization that he was running. Mm -hmm. And so he got eBay to reduce their fees, being that he was an NFP, and then was selling it and uh, not... It it was... He basically was creating himself this, like, little pirating tax break, and it was... um, It was pretty bad. Well, yeah, they were cutting down his fees and everything, but the thing that is interesting here and why i think that they're probably mostly gray market keys and they just did some stupid things and got in trouble is because they are saying we don't know where any of these serial numbers came from and we're still looking into it so they have no idea 
where or where or how they got these serial numbers. So I'm, I would put money down on the fact that they're all gray market and they just did those stupid things like you know illegally obviously running a non for profit that's really not a non for profit and then number two reselling the same serial numbers over and over and over again which is piracy. So I bet if they didn't do those two things. This would still be a gray area and they wouldn't be in trouble if they have, like I think, the gray market serial numbers. Yeah, That's the, only, the only line that I can find in the article about this is that Software Slashers was reselling tens of thousands of stolen Microsoft registration codes obtained from a source in China. It's like, well, were they actually buying, was it actually stolen or was it against the license agreement? Because I'm not sure that the people, invest, if Microsoft is saying, hey, these guys are pirating our stuff, you can bet that the feds are probably not going to question that, and they're probably going to go arrest those guys. But yes, absolutely, these guys are doing a whole bunch of other shady stuff, which does not really give them any credibility. All right. Let's move on and talk about CISA for just a minute, and then we'll have some fun after this garbage. So they were able to sneak CISA into a giant budgeting bill. There's some good things in the budgeting bill, but in 2,000 pages... I, it's, there's going to be a lot of junk in there, and, and I don't think I, w- I would I would guess that not any and uh, not anybody in in the Senate or the Congress has fully read any of this stuff. It's two thousand pages. They're just going to look at it and be like, "Tell me what it does. What does it do? Is it good? Okay, is Randy signing it? Because if Randy ain't going to sign it, I ain't going to sign it because he's going to get me a handshake from that oil executive. So <laughs> that's how it works. Some people have commented that. Congress should not be allowed to pass laws that are bundled together like this. And I could see that, but you've got to understand that there's a very there's a very important thing that can happen where that's useful, and that is compromise, where you get in a situation where you want something and the other people don't want that thing, and they want something and you don't necessarily want it, but maybe you'll tolerate it. And so you can get together and say, well, if you do this, then I'll do that. Quid pro quo, uh, it's a quid pro quo, basically. And that seems to have been what's happened here, except it happened with CISA, which was overwhelmingly not supported by the American people and not supported by a huge number of companies, although some companies have been very duplicitous in their support about that. But they snuck CISA through on this omnibus spending bill. Basically, the federal government will shut down if this doesn't pass. And I think that's really sneaky and wrong. Not to mention that there are massive problems with CISA. Basically, this version of CISA does not have any protections at all. And it's also uh, retroactive for the data that has been collected. So, like, for example, AT&T has, I believe that AT&T has your text message history and calling history for the last 10 years. If that wasn't legal to turn over to the government without warrant or oversight before, it is now. There are some things in CISA that say your personal information must be redacted and it's up to, up to the company to do that. But in practice, that's really probably not going to happen. If for no other reason than with the metadata, it is super easy to put it together. You can also get into a situation where they supply interesting data and they say, oh, this data is interesting. We want to know who it was. And get that administrative FISA court thing that's not exactly a warrant. And it's like, oh, that was this guy. So it's like, this is definitely not a win for consumers in terms of consumer data protection and in terms of data sharing. And it's really, really unnerving that it has been passed into law this way. It was, it was in one day, in one day, when is the last time anything has ever, I mean, good Lord, this is crazy. Well, and, well I mean, it, this also came out right around the whole Star Wars thing. Because Star Wars was probably, it's probably, Star Wars... I guess as far as media coverage goes, is up there with like a, a, a terrorist attack or something. It's like way up there, probably even bigger than that. Don't take that the wrong way. I'm not saying that Star Wars is a terrorist attack. I know some people, someone in the comments is going to try to link those together and say I said something heinous when I didn't. But anyway, no, I it's, say, it's I, just overwhelming news coverage. Well, part of it's overwhelming, but also it's it's recognizing that there's going to be a lot of people. But in, in line with what you said, I do believe, I can't... Can't remember where. Uh, I did see an article where there was a concern about theaters and with Star Wars coming out and heightened security. Mm-hmm. Um, being that it is, you know, theaters are going to be packed, all of them, all weekend long. Oh, I didn't even think about that. I was just talking about how big the news of Star Wars was, and that's why they're starting to, and that's, that's why they've sneaked so many strange things 
uh, through the Congress and stuff. Oh, absolutely. Oh, now, this happens every single time there's anything crazy like this goes on. There's always something you hear about it after. Wait, wait they did what? I was too busy worried about lightsabers and NASA also got more somebody. money than they, they asked for in their budget. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that was, was done in part to appease some of the people that have opposed this in the past because a lot of the tech savvy, a lot of the people in the know with technology have have looked at this and said, you know, this really isn't very good. And against the advice of people that know what they're doing, it was passed into law anyway. So it's very much a, a quid pro quo situation. But it's not, a, it's not immediately clear who the players are. But we have this other article that says Facebook has been publicly against it. But actually, there seems to be a paper trail for lobbying and other organizations that say that Facebook supports it. And so that's sort of an interesting situation where Facebook is saying, oh, yeah, this is not good for consumers. It's really bad. We need it. Pass it. It's good. Go. So I wonder if not maybe a lot of that was going on on Capitol Hill in order to get this thing through because a a lot of uh, people seem to want it that are not in the technological sector but a lot of technology companies don't see this as a net good thing. Ultimately, this is going to be bad for the U.S. economy. I mean, if anything, this is going to accelerate adoption of open source because this is just another situation where you're not going to want your data in the cloud. You're not going to want your data on servers that are controlled by U.S. companies. And I can't believe lawmakers don't see that. What ha- I mean, was Facebook evil from day one? Yeah. They pretty much were, right? <laughs> I mean, was Zuckerberg... Facebook- was he- is he is he was he has he always been an evil mastermind? If you read some of his early quotes, he he definitely uh, he definitely has an attitude where uh, you know it's like oh they shared their data with me I can do what I want with it I can make money right, with it yeah. it's completely fine. You can see that he doesn't feel like he has any kind of responsibility to be a good steward of what uh, people have done with him. You know we have a saying where sometimes we say you know the people are the product. You know if you're not paying for it blah 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 you know you are the product in that case and it's clear that zuckerberg thinks along those lines and that's that's sort of why that he's made the money that he has i mean he runs a business he's entitled to make money however he sees fit i mean technically a purely capitalistic business its first duty is to the uh, shareholders financial interests both long term and short term so we get into a situation where uh, it, for them to make money, they're going to exploit the data any which way they can. Marketing to convince you to buy things, to manipulate your opinion, whatever you know, whatever shape that happens to take. I, I always imagine that when Facebook got started, Zuckerberg was doing this in sort of a kind of a, a social experiment, but also in a little bit of a stalker kind of way. Like, let's see if we can get a bunch of random people to put bikini pictures in their home address on the internet. <laughs> and <laughs> holy crap, they're doing it. These guys are idiots. I I got a feeling like that was involved a little bit. And then he was just like, well, these... And then from there, it just turned into like, I'm not doing anything. Does every, the terms of service say that? People are doing it? Screw them. I've got sandals on. <laughs> well, in, in AT&T's case, so... Uh, there, this is not the first time this has happened. About 10 years ago, this happened with AT&T because AT&T was doing warrantless wiretaps and somebody sued them. And it was getting ready to come out in court that you know they might be criminally liable for that. And so Congress hurried up and passed a law that made AT&T retroactively immune from having shared this same type of data, but telecommunications data, um, on federal authorities. And the reason they had done that is because they could charge, I think, $300 per line per month for any kind of taps uh, that they wanted to do on those lines. And so that was a significant source of revenue for them. And that was literally the only reason. It was literally, oh, we can make money before charging for this service? Mm, That sounds great. And $300 (laughs) per month per line, I mean, that sounds like a lot, but it's not really that much money. Let's uh, segue on over and take a look at the store. So, Lance and Tickets, guys, you guys have like another week or so to get these at the reduced price of $75. Uh, so go ahead and grab them up, and it'll be freaking tons of fun, Seattle. We got some special things in store for you. And uh, now that I'm, you know, we're both back in town from China, we're going to start planning some shenanigans and maybe some events, some tournaments. We'll have more time to plan, but uh, we've, got, we've got like four months. But go ahead and get your tickets now before the end of the year when the price goes up to the regular price. So do it. go ahead and get it. Um, also, the uh, shirt of the month here. I, I like this shirt of the month. Uh, I, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about this. 
John tells me that this one is not selling very well. Krampus is, is or Krampus, that's how you say it. Krampus, Krampus. is, he's freaking awesome. Uh, Santa Claus, when he first came out, he looked a little black. Let's not uh, call the kettle any other color. The kettle is black. Santa Claus is black. Um, and John was like, hey, he uh, came out really dark. And I was like, he was like, want me to fix it? I was like, fix what? Does anyone have a problem with that? Is that is that why it's not selling well, everybody? Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wanted to call people out on that. It's funny. I think he looks pretty badass. He just looks really pissed off to me. Yeah. In all reality, he's, he is whatever you want him to be. He's Santa Claus. He's an imaginary figure. Krampus is real. Mm -hmm. I've seen them. They run around town scaring people. Poking them with sticks. Some guy in the comments right now. Saint Nicholas is who you should have had because you know I, I have a comment on that one right there. And this is take, uh, take care of it. when you look at when you look at historical translations or or trying to explain a story to a a, a different culture. Uh, sometimes you don't hear things quite right, and Saint Nicholas could very well have been turned into Santa Claus. Saint Nicholas, Santa Claus, when you're speaking, I don't know, like a Dutch accent to a really stupid person in the northeast of America. I don't know. We're talking a couple Way back of years when. ago. So it did, came out as Saint Nicholas, Santa Claus, somewhere in there. That's the same reason that we call Japan, Japan, and not Nippon. Exactly. Same exact reason. If you guys are calling it Japan, well, that's because someone screwed up somewhere and, you know... They they either couldn't read their handwriting or couldn't understand each other, and they said Japan, and I was like, and then Japan's like Japan, what's that? We're Nippon, Nippon, and now nowadays it's either Nippon or uh, Nihon, Nihon, um, like Nihongo is Japanese, uh, but yeah, it's 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 just a mistransliteration. Playing and... telephone on a global scale without a phone. Well, there's at least one mosaic where Saint Nicholas looks like a Klingon, so I'm gonna go with that he was a Klingon. He was definitely a Klingon here in ours. Absolutely. <laughs> anyway, so we've got we've got plenty of stuff in the store, guys. Um, got our people. People ask for things. We go get them. People said, "Hey, can you get some shot glasses?" I was like, "I'll do you one better. I'll get a Lexington Jigger, three point five ounces." I love these stainless steel um, carabiner mugs. The, the, I just like them a lot. They're great for camping. I, I just think they're. I'm drinking. I should be drinking out of it right now. I just. It's just. I like it. Anyway. Uh, oh, and then the growlers. These <coughs> things are matte and nice. Anyway, um, also want to thanks, say thanks to all the Patreon supporters. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. We've got a lot of stuff coming. I didn't expect it to be high enough to hit any of the goals before the end of the year. I guess I was thinking humbly and modestly, but yeah. We, <laughs> I tell you what's some... humbling is humbling is the number of people that are like, here, have money. And it's like, holy crap, I don't even know what to do. I do. We get to work. <laughs> we'll, we'll be hiring people very soon as well. I'd, I figure a lot of the transitions will come after the beginning of the year because it's, you know, in China, we've got to move at the beginning of the year. So just be patient and thank you very much. We do have new original content coming out now that Kane is here. Uh, so, yeah, and we've, we have shot a, a couple of inbox videos. So just stay tuned for lots of content. I'm not, I'm not going to just try to give you guys more content. I'm going to try to up the quality while maintaining the integrity of, how you know, our, our raw style. I don't want to get overly produced but you know make better content yeah that's that's the king content is king the rest is all fun so all right comcast more comcast stuff this is a fun article fun because they've been filling landfills with stuff that shouldn't be in a landfill like old routers and remotes and modems and all kinds of things so they've been ordered to pay 26 million dollars for illegally dumping hazardous materials this is a great company. I mean, this is like <laughs> obvious stuff. It's like you, they make the products. And on the back of the product, it's like, please do not throw into landfill. And they're like, they get them and they're like, hmm, how much money can we save throwing these things into a landmill, landfill? And quite a bit of money, we'll throw them all away. There's two sides of this that I really want to point out, but I think Wendell's got something a little more important to say. Well, it's just Comcast is so crazy at the <laughs> yeah, i always say that but it's just i don't even the lead-based paint not really lead-based electronics uh in the in the thing i think is what they're they're mainly worried about but the data caps thing are rolling out everywhere and they can't even keep track of the data the actual amount of data that you've used accurately mainly they're just concerned about everybody this christmas getting netflix and hulu and 
HBO to go, and then they're not selling TV anymore, which is a cash cow, and they're really, really worried about that. So it's like, how do we charge more people? It's like, we've expanded as much as we can. How do we charge people more for what they already have? That's, I, that's I basically think the, data the name of the game. I think the data cap thing is eventually going to blow up in the face of Comcast and a number of other co uh, companies because they're doing it in such a sloppy and haphazard way. And they're also testing the market with the data caps to see how the customers respond to, uh, you know, basically being taken advantage of. They're like, well, let's just abuse these guys over here just a little bit. They're gonna they're gonna have a, they're gonna have a, a series of statistics that are come out and be like, well, we tested it in all these markets and everybody continued to use our service. I'm like, that's because there's nobody else in those markets that can provide them with internet. Meanwhile, over thirteen thousand complaints have been filed with the FCC based upon the broadband caps. Many of them claiming that they have no idea why they're hitting their cap. They're using their email every day, and then at the end of the week, it's like, oh, you used sixty gigabytes this week, and they're like, I checked my email six times. One guy. From Tennessee, he's a Linux system administrator, and he also uh, um, he, he programs and and uh, submits code to the kernel of Linux. So this guy knows what he's doing. He's got his stuff on lockdown. He said that he it's highly unlikely that anyone's stealing his Wi-Fi, and he always plugs in via uh, even with his laptop. He plugs in he hardwires. So he was on vacation. He gets back and he's used like you know a couple hundred gigabytes, something ridiculous like that. Uh, where's that with that one? Uh, it's over here somewhere. He eventually. In that like, he just went back and forth with Comcast, and they were like, no, our numbers are accurate, our numbers are accurate. So he yeah. unplugged his modem, like, unplugged it, and he was still <laughs> racking up data charges. And then yep. Ars Technica contacted Comcast, and they were like, oh, whoops, our bad, sorry. And uh, everything's fine now, we just had a little glitch in the accounting thing. And it's like, yeah, yeah, you had a little glitch in the accounting yeah, they, thing. They, they, his, claimed his, that, his... they claimed it was a MAC address mix-up. <laughs> Oops. But that doesn't explain the thousands and thousands of other people. That doesn't explain why they didn't check it the other 300 times that guy called in. I know how this played out. I've been down this road yeah. myself. He called in. He was on hold for an hour. Then he got, got to talk to some <laughs> slack-jawed yokel that had no idea what they were doing. Then he was eventually passed up to Tier 3 who just said, This sounds so implausible. I'm just going to ignore what you're saying and not bother looking at it. And then, you know, fast forward three weeks, and here we are with Ars Technica, and then Ars Technica looks into it, and an executive gets a clue in their head that maybe this is going to be a PR, yet another PR disaster for Comcast. And then he's like, you know, we probably ought to actually look into this. And so you get a support person that you can't otherwise reach on that support line. It's, it's like tier 37 on the uh, the whole tier <laughs> system where you can't get past tier three or four on that Comcast call in line. So that is exactly what happened. An ordinary citizen would have no chance of dealing with this. And this is part of the problem that we have with Comcast because when, when Comcast, you know, flag, we reported, I think two or three months ago where Comcast has a thing in their system where if like the person is important, like they're a senator or a lawmaker or a judge or something like that, they flag it in their system and treat that account differently than they do ordinary people. And that is very bad. That is, that is so bad. That is the threat that big data brings because all of a sudden, you know, as a customer, more, certain customers are more valuable than other customers. And so they can treat a certain segment of their customers like crap. So now's the time to grab your torches and pitchforks. If Comcast is in your area, Call them up and tell them how bad the idea of a data cap is and how you are going to explore the options for another ISP. You, you absolutely should not be held hostage by your communications company. There was an economist, I think we mentioned this a bunch of episodes ago, there was an economist that did a study on communications costs and they basically found that no matter what the communications costs were, people would pay it because they have to have it. They have to have it to do their job. They have to have it for entertainment. They have to have it for everything. But cable television and other sort of discretionary spending, like law, yard work, like people were getting rid of their lawn guy before they were getting rid of their internet connection. Because with the internet connection, you, you work, you play, you do everything over it. So it's they can basically charge whatever they want, and they will because they can, not because they're delivering value. Yeah, and then you can have a lawn in a virtual environment if you've got the internet. <laughs> Who needs a real lawn? Just pave uh, it. It'll be fine. The FCC, um, they're going to make AT&T and T-Mobile and Comcast answer to the whole zero rating thing with the data bandwidth caps. And that's where, you know, like, for instance, Comcast has their own TV streaming service. And they're like, that doesn't count against your data bandwidth because all these ridiculous reasons that we've made up. 
And then T-Mobile is like, oh, we've got a number of different services that are not just T-Mobile. They're doing it a little bit more. It's all bad, but they're doing it in T-Mobile. a better way. They're they're making it open to anyone who wants to opt in or whatever. I forget how it works, but they, they have yeah. to basically uh, contact the FCC before January 15th. They have to make technical people and business people available to justify this practice of, you know, zero uh, uh, rating. So anyway, we I say? looked into the I looked into the, the specific plan from T-Mobile. Here's the deal: with Netflix and some other services, the reason that Net that T-Mobile is allowing this is that Netflix is basically reconfiguring itself just for T-Mobile's network. So right. in addition to ha- having a local stream that may be located at the tower, even I don't know I don't know how the I don't know how that part of it is going to work. They haven't been really public with that. So I mean, conceivably, there could be a Netflix caching device that T-Mobile is going to roll out to their towers or to be part of their tower network at the very least. But those are actually lower than normal quality versions of movies and stuff that will stream to your phone. I really think this is a disingenuous argument, and I'll tell you why. Netflix has built into it the ability to deal with varying amounts of bandwidth. And so T-Mobile is saying, well, the reason that we're going to allow... um, Netflix or the reason that we're going to allow services that are compliant with our requirements to stream in an unlimited fashion is because they will respond to the uh, amount of available network bandwidth and we can control how much bandwidth they use when they watch their shows but other services don't do that this is a lie this should be exposed as a lie at, at, at well okay at best this is a gross misunderstanding of how the technology works and can works and works today on the internet and at worst, it's a horrible lie that needs to be exposed as such so that these people can be put through the ringer. There exists a technology called traffic shaping. Traffic shaping is where you take the amount of bandwidth that you have and sort of shape uh, the, the amount of bandwidth down to something that's reasonable. And so if T-Mobile wants to have people only have a certain amount of bandwidth for video, T-Mobile is basically saying they only want people to have a certain amount of bandwidth for these things data is data if i can stream video at a low quality with basically unlimited without any any kind of a data cap then i should be able to do that not just with video with anything because data is data with traffic shaping they're basically taking the total amount of bandwidth on the tower and they're not giving the maximum amount of bandwidth that they have available on the tower to the individual phone they're saying that the phone can use no more than this amount of bandwidth and so in T-Mobile's case, they're saying they can use no more than this amount of bandwidth for the unlimited streaming video, and it's handled on Netflix's end. But traffic shaping is a completely ordinary and normal thing. They could be doing that with anything. They could be doing that with YouTube traffic. YouTube traffic doesn't need to do anything special. This is something that T-Mobile would elect to do. And I think this is something that's, that would be legal for them to, to do as part of the normal network maintenance um, thing that they do. I, I don't see any kind of a problem with that necessarily i mean there you could implement it in a trollish kind of way i suppose but you know on the surface it seems like that would be completely reasonable and quality of services and quality of service and traffic shaping is not service service specific necessarily mm-hmm. and it's interesting because when we were in taipei this is how they did it there if you were on 4g then your bandwidth was metered if you were on 3g your bandwidth was unmetered i thought that was interesting I can almost support that. I'm, I'm pretty much totally against data bandwidth caps across the board, but in some certain certain circumstances where um, you do have bandwidth limitations based upon how many people are trying to use the same towers and stuff like for cell service, I think traffic shaping is probably the best solution to allow everyone to have at least some quality of experience. But really, well, if they've can... if they've got that many people signed up, they should be building more towers because that they're have, getting more income. You can have very elaborate traffic shaping rule, rules. I mean, modern telecommunications equipment, you can totally say, hey, if this guy has been using tons and tons of bandwidth and we've got a, a bandwidth constraint problem, then relegate him to the 256 kilobit bucket. Meanwhile, somebody that hasn't really used as much data can have a faster, better experience. I see no problem at all with that. I, I, it's just... Well, it's well they totally already do the, that. Yeah, yeah, some, some, some yeah, some. Well, like, yeah. like T-Mobile, if you use over five or ten gigs on your cellular plan, they will throttle you down, and and it's it's it is like a two hundred fifty six kilobit or slower uh, connection. It's it's pretty obnoxious. You'd be like, yay, I'm doing something, and then suddenly you're like, 
why is my phone not working right? Or if you're, you know, <laughs> tethering it, it's kind of crazy like that. I mean, there's a, there's a couple of different things I want to I want to point out here is that you've got your data caps, which are you're not allowed to use more than this, or we're going to charge you extra because you're an overuser, da da da. And that the problem with a lot of the caps that we're seeing is that they're set obnoxiously low. Like, oh, okay, you're on Comcast. We're selling you a hundred mega second connection. You only get to use, you know. 500 gigs a month and I'm like it's 300 I 300, think. Uh, 300 and yeah. that's the maximum it's like 300, 300 gigs yeah, a month. I'm like most places 300 if you are using your internet connection to watch Netflix and Hulu you will burn through that really quick especially if you're streaming it at 1080p all the time or in some cases 4k um, and that's where it's kind of going but even at 300 gigs is 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 obnoxious and and the other the other side of this is most people your average consumer they are moving more closer and closer to be using that 300 gigs on average and that's it's getting obnoxious the other side of this i'm looking at is uh, when it comes to like cell towers is you've only got so much bandwidth that goes into the tower and then you have to relegate it out to you know individual phones that are connected to that tower and the digital radios that are in there and you can only have so much that's coming in and out and where you said that maybe they should build more towers that's more of a nightmare to build a new tower because you have to go through there's yeah, you have to go to the city. He has to say okay, and you have to go to the city. You have to get federal. You have to yeah. get federal permits, local permits. You have to actually have a space that you can build it in. I mean, that, that's that's a, a nightmare. Which is yeah. why AT and T kept trying to buy all of these other cellular providers because they 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 ran out of bandwidth on their system because everybody had an iPhone. Yeah, and I remember when I was in Vermont, I, I have T Mobile, and I couldn't get a connection anywhere. And finally, I was like, "What the hell's going on?" So I did some research, and there's like two T Mobile towers in Vermont because Vermont was like. Um, we have enough towers. No more towers in the state. No more cutting down trees, and they're ugly. Yeah. And there's like, no, that's it. There's like, what do you mean? That's it. No more towers? No, no more towers. And the the big problem is that you get companies like AT and T or Sprint or T Mobile that their their tower is owned by them and operated, so they have to lease out space on the tower to other providers, and they're not going to do that. Like, why would we want to give you the ability to service customers here? Well, they okay, but with all the money they're making. They need to, okay, if they can't invest in towers, they need to up their R&D budget to try to figure out how to maximize each tower, how to improve the technology. They need to be spending millions and millions on R&D to figure out what to do to make each individual tower support millions of people. Except, how am I going to pay for my yacht? And how are you going to buy, how are you going to buy the competitors? I do like that the FCC has included Comcast in its request to explain why data caps because Comcast is on record as telling the shareholders uh, this really isn't about last mile bandwidth we've actually got plenty of capacity this is really about us trying to make the shareholders more money which I guess is cool because it's a publicly traded company those transcripts are available from shareholders because that's what they told shareholders so I really hope that the FCC uses that to flay them alive <laughs> yeah no that see that that's one of those where again from the Comcast infrastructure is like, oh yeah, we've got plenty of bandwidth handing out. So we're totally giving these people 100 meg connection or 200 or or up to 500 meg connection to our stuff. But yeah, we, we don't really have, wanna increase, this goes back to the Netflix thing. It's like, we don't wanna increase the pipe that we've got going to Cogent. So uh, no, Netflix should just buy bandwidth from us and put their caching systems inside of our network because it costs us money to, to, to lease more data from the backbone. My favorite think paragraph people... in that whole article was Comcast doesn't offer third-party services the ability to not count against its home internet data caps, but it does exempt its own stream TV and home streaming service from the cap. However, Comcast says this does not violate any rules because stream TV is an IP cable service similar to cable TV delivered separately from internet access. So you mean to tell me the internet, which is delivered over TCP IP, is different than IP TV? Yes, and the reason that it's different is because the internet is when my network connects to, and and this is where this is where they're this is this is they the, have a very specific definition of what the internet is. If if the internet <laughs> okay if if you have a a system in your home that's streaming IP based uh, you know uh, uh, video streams to a TV in your home, you are not using the internet. And Comcast is saying that well, if you're on the Comcast network. It's not the internet because it's all the Comcast network. Not trying, and it's and it's trying to isolate itself. At least this is my take on it. It's trying to isolate itself from 
the rest of the world. Uh, so me connecting to my neighbor, I should be able to stream gigs of data to my neighbor as long as he's on Comcast and it not count against my cap. That's where I think we can be able to mm -hmm. tie him up and string him up. Like, yeah, this shouldn't count against it. It's going over. It's just internal streaming here. Yeah, if, if I am connecting from uh, me in my home to you and you're on Comcast and I'm on Comcast, I don't care if it goes over the uh, the, the You know, you know what they'll probably do? They'll count. probably be like, yeah, but you know that data, it doesn't just go door to door. It has to come out to the facility. And then it and then it peers through Cogent and then it goes through an AT&T thing and then it comes back. That's and that's what, and that's that's what they're going to claim. But that's if it's but if, at which point we have to re reiterate that well, then if that's the case, uh, I've looked at my trace routes from here to the guy up the street or the guy across town. It never leaves the Comcast network. This should not count in any way, shape, or form against any kind of data cap. In which case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start providing uh, backbone service to Comcast people by creating a video streaming system to compete with, <laughs> and just say, hey, "Hey, we got free bandwidth. This is great." All right, let's uh, let's segue over to something a little different. I think people are probably uh, sick of that joke. Probably, probably no, probably sick of the whole Comcast garbage that we hear all the time. But yeah, they're probably sick of that joke too. Anyway, <laughs> um, Baidu. Now, Baidu is is um, the Google of China, and they have created a very interesting learning algorithm that is, they say, better at the um, uh, better at, at speech recognition than a human being and they've done some tests i'm not sure how you would figure that out but the whole thing about this is they haven't gone in and specifically programmed it to you know to to hear certain phrases they have allowed it to listen to thousands and thousands of hours of audio recordings and it has developed its own intelligence and now has become better than a human at speech recognition it sounds i like believe it, it it sounds like it might be beyond what uh, you know google and apple have going on there says it can recognize English and Mandarin speech better than people. Well, that is something that I can attest to, that I have a difficult time. Um, actually, I have a more difficult time hearing and understanding Cantonese than I do Mandarin. But Mandarin, was it took me six months before I could actually hear the deciphering and the differences in, in, uh, in words. I'm not going to pretend like I can do anything other than say hello, and, and I probably sound like I'm saying, hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah. That's probably what I sound terrible like. Terrible American accent. Yeah. <laughs> well, show up. Ni hao. <laughs> How y'all doing? And then looking at you going, what? Yeah. Oh, yes. Dumb American trying to speak Chinese. Just give up. It's okay. Harry Hello. crabs. Is that a disease? Oh, you eat them? <laughs> uh, yeah. We so get anyway. by just fine in China. Food roulette is fun. Anyway. Yeah, we get by do as well in China. We do. Um, so that's kind of interesting. I, I think, I wonder what these companies could do if they were turned loose on the rest of the world. Right now, China, has, they've got the Great Firewall of China, and really that's may, mostly because China has, has, likes the idea of keeping out the Western influence so that their country, so that their um, uh, local companies can thrive and their local population is not as tainted by Western culture. I think that's a lot of it. It's more of a parental like, no, you don't want to play with that poison why would you mess with that why why do they have that accent i don't know um anyway the, yeah, so they have there's a lot of really interesting companies over there uh i while well, while over there i installed wechat which is made in shenzhen um and blows away pretty much Everything. all the other chat I think it's better than hangouts it's better than uh um skype it's better than twitter and it's better it's, than WhatsApp. it's it's better than instagram and it's it's all in the same better than whatsapp and it's all in one app and you can use it on your computer. And I like the the logging in algorithm. The way that works is really interesting too. If you have your phone in your hand and you want to log in on your screen, a QR code pops up on your computer. You show your phone, hey, it's me. And it's like, oh, okay, you, you logged in. So don't let anybody steal your phone. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's the flip side of this is that it's, it's a Chinese app. And how is it tied into the Chinese uh, government? It's the questions you ask. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's it, the same thing here with the NSA. But anyway, yeah, if I mean, anybody's on anything here, they're, they're, everything's going the, through the, the NSA. The difference would be that you get an app like this knowing full well that, yep, that's happening, versus, oh, no, 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 we can't. So it's you're giving up a level of uh, your own personalized uh, privacy functionality just to 
yeah. just to use. I would, I would love a, a program in America that was like WeChat. That would be cool. Or in another country. I don't know. I, I'm using the one from from My Shenzhen German right now. viewers, you guys, make make an app. Go get WeChat and then make something similar. Yeah, it's nice. It's it's anyway. By deep learning, this this actually makes a lot of sense too. If you're considering the fact that on a language level, there are more tones in Mandarin and more tones in like Cantonese than English uh, or many other languages on the planet, and having that uh, further range of of tone would mean that you'd have to program for those ranges of tones, which means English recognition would be easy. Yeah, I mean, in comparison, I imagine Japanese would too, because English and Japanese both just have two two tones, so. Yeah. All right, moving right along. Is it an app you guys should try if you like WeChat and you want something more secure? Which, which app? Telegram. Telegram. I have to try Telegram. WeChat oh, just we, did so many things. They were supposed to open source the server component of it. They have not done that yet. Mm-hmm. I believe some Russian developers developed the server component of it. But the client is open source, and so the client is auditable. And there are actually several clients. The client appears to be secure in its key exchange mechanism from what I can tell. Mm-hmm. I guess what I liked about WeChat was the fact that it had so many more, uh, so many things built into it. Like it had the video chat was nice, but also moments, which which is essentially like a hybrid of your Twitter feed, Instagram, and maybe even your Facebook wall. Because mm-hmm. all your friends, whatever they say, post pictures and they can post updates and stuff and it all shows up there. It's also got a built-in it's, translator. It's Yeah, it's wild. And uh, it's just it's a crazy app, and I again the, the amount of functionality that's in there and the the ease of use I think is is what's fascinating in it. And looking for that kind of quality of uh, application in in other in other apps is it's very hard to come by. All right, uh, Wendell Imperial Violet, do you want to talk to him about that for just a minute? <laughs> so uh, yeah, this is a thing. Turns out Juniper, you know, we talked about the root kit, basically not really, sort of kind of that was going around uh, for Cisco devices. So Juniper, another big manufacturer like Cisco, makes a lot of core routers and firewalls and that sort of thing. Uh, turns out Juniper has had a backdoor since 2012 and no one noticed. So how are those closed source solutions feeling now in terms of security? Um, it may be uh, something related to the the thing where the NSA published you know the elliptic curve encryption which is a very good encryption but some of the sample prime numbers or whatever uh were maybe designed to pick a weak curve so that they would be able to break and intercept some things there were some basically some high profile hacks recently and then we were trying to figure out we the security community were trying to figure out exactly how that happened and it turns out that one of the ways that it may have happened is because of the whole weak elliptic curve encryption thing and then a little bit more digging, and Juniper has officially announced that there is some unauthorized code that has been insert, inserted into, into their firmware sometime around 2012, and been there the whole time. So if you have any Juniper equipment from 2012, <laughs> patch up and patch off, and <laughs> because uh, it turns out that it's fairly easy to decrypt VPN traffic and other secure exchanges. And so even though you may have been using a VPN with a with a Juniper endpoint. Uh, it's the encryption algorithm is actually very weak. It doesn't it doesn't pick prime numbers the way that it should. This this basically on a, on an episode when we of the tech when we first encountered the whole elliptic curve thing and it may be compromised. Um, we talked about how if that actually happened, if the NSA actually made the elliptic curve encryption weak, and if RSA making that the default encryption protocol, you know, took some money from the NSA for doing it because it looks strong, but isn't actually strong if you know exactly what way it's weak, then this is what the hacks would look like. And interestingly enough, here we are with the Juniper firewalls. Uh, you know, here it is. This looks exactly like it would look if that was a thing, if that played out basically the way that we said it would in terms of weakening uh, weakening the elliptic curve encryption. Now they so said they had, that's been... Mm-hmm. Uh, they said they had unauthorized code. Yeah. They say that how they had that, unauthorized how, code. How do you how do you get a company like Juniper? How does it get code inserted into its system? Yeah, without yeah, them that. knowing it. <laughs> After this, we need dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only thing that fits there. No words fit there. Dun, like, dun, dun, I mean, dun, dun, we're talking. Dun, dun. Yeah, I know. I know exactly. That's the elephant in the room, right? It's yeah. like we're you know we're talking about the the you know NSA and RSA and the weak encryption, but unauthorized code this is like saying so who's the guy standing in the corner oh no, no, no. 
<laughs> it's like seriously, if there was a dude standing right here and nobody sat You're here, just like what like, guy? Yeah, you ask him like, how do you not notice this? What are you talking about? There's nobody. So, who? who? Here, if you want to, if you want to grab your tin foil hat for a second, I've got there mine. was a not with the elliptic curve, but there was a similar incident in terms of unauthorized code that happened with the Linux kernel, because because Linus Torvalds is a crazy paranoid person. He actually maintained. This is how he knew two different copies of the kernel. One was in BitKeeper and one was like on source bucket or something. I don't know where it was, but, but this is before <laughs> Git. And uh, uh, there was a very subtle bug. It was a, it was a one character change introduced. It was like an equal equal and a C, C uh, a Boolean check that was replaced with an equal. It was buried deep in the, in the Linux kernel, literally a one character change. And it was unaccounted for in one version control system, and it did not appear, the problem did not appear in another version control system. There was no commit history, there was no, it was very, very, like, super expertly done, like, spooky hair on the back of your neck stands up, how did it get this way? And it would have never been caught if uh, Linus did not maintain a second parallel copy of the source code, and he was comparing things, and he's like, wait a minute, something changed but the source code control systems are not reporting that anything changed i don't understand what the difference is and so he went through and found it it was like oh one equal equal was changed to an equal equal being an assignment operator not a boolean operation which could result in local root escalation privileges <laughs> in the linux kernel i remember so like, that because that wow was... One, that was one a one character change and, uh, yeah. Linus that, and it's to so catch subtle it. too. It, 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 I mean, if you're if you're looking at it, you just kind of you kind of glance over it. But that change made it so instead of saying if this is root, it was this is now root. Yes. <laughs> what? <laughs> so you know, you're talking about him being paranoid, but he was paranoid rightfully so. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of people who don't like his uh, style, and I don't not flamboyance, but his his just he just doesn't care about business norms. He just does his thing. But that's one of the things that makes him a bit special. So they found anyway. no evidence of a security problem or a compromise. I mean, they went through those systems with a fine tooth comb, and there was no evidence of anything. The only thing they can figure is that, you know, there had to be like. I mean, they don't even. No one even really wants to speculate about that. That is actually connected to that. It's just one of those spooky hair on the back of your neck things. And is that what happened with the Juniper source code, or is it that? the back door that was put here for use um, of the intelligence community was discovered by a third party. Was it discovered by, you know, another nation state other than the U.S. and it was exploited in a, in a very public way? Or did, you know, one of the U.S.'s own teams exploit this in a way that could be detected? Oops, and we got detected. Don't know. It's not clear. But any of those scenarios are very bad s scenarios. And incidentally, illustrate why back doors for encryption are just never going to happen. If people know there are back doors there, they will look for them and they will exploit them and the systems will not be secure for anybody. And so by um, our lawmakers misunderstanding on purpose, I think, encryption, <laughs> wanting to put back doors and everything, this, this is the situation that you end up in. The criminals will use it just as easily as the intelligence community. And so introducing these kinds of weaknesses into encryption is really cutting off our nose to spot our face. Are you guys ready for another bad segue into something I'm very excited about? Yes. I'm ready for this. Okay, so NVIDIA. They've got the NVIDIA Gameworks uh, set of, I guess, tools for game developers that allow them to easily implement things like lighting and shadows and, and hair effects and, and things like that. Well, th those are closed and they're... I mean, they, they work on other stuff, but not really well. You know, they're really made for NVIDIA products, uh, depth of field, and all, the, all these really cool effects they look neat yeah, they look really neat well it's a very close platform so amd decided you know what we're going to make our own platform and we're going to make it open so developers can use it they can, can they can write stuff for it they can contribute to it i mean this is a real open source pro project it's it's under the mit standard open source license agreement so it's called gpu open and i'll scroll down here and show you guys some of the stuff it'll do of course tress effects uh three is going to be uh there geometry effects uh, AOFX, ShadowFX, and uh, we've got plenty of tools. And then all the different libraries and SDKs. I'm, I'm pretty excited about AMD's Liquid VR, uh, Fire, Fire Rendering. I mean, look at all this stuff. you got like 
Uh, DirectX 11 and 12 right now are the primary focus, but I'm AMD, please do Vulkan. Please do Vulkan, would you please? OpenGL would be nice too, but uh, Vulkan I think is going to uh, supplant OpenGL as the primary API for Linux and hopefully also for Windows as well. That way we can have a unified platform, but I think Valve is going to be pushing in that direction uh, as well. But this stuff should have been open from, from the beginning, NVIDIA. Um, it should have been something that benefits the gamers. And you could be like, listen, we did this to benefit gamers, so you should like our company because we're doing good things for the world. Not, hey, we made this. It runs on our stuff, so you got to buy it. You know? <laughs> that's, that's, they also the, that's did the something. They, they also did something insanely clever around CUDA. So CUDA is NVIDIA's... Kudos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kudos, kudos to them the, the CUDA <laughs> implementation but they didn't yeah. implement CUDA they made a translation platform so they didn't want to implement this whole Java thing where where it's like an API is copyrightable oh, oh this, is, this is not good this kind of applies here because AMD you know if you look at it the Fury X in terms of the number of floating point operations per second that you can get it absolutely destroys top-end NVIDIA cards in terms of how many mathematical computations it can do. The NVIDIA software is way more optimized. Game works better for games, blah, blah, blah. Those kinds of things. The, and, and again, Fury, a parallel, truly parallel computation, for, especially for certain kinds of parallel comp computation. The Fury X does really well with that. But the software is really not where it needs to be. Enter the hip. This is, uh, <laughs> this is a, uh, a heterogeneous compute interface for portability library which will take your CUDA code and make it like so, so if you're a developer and you've got all this stuff that's working really great on CUDA theoretically when this comes out in January you should be able to take your CUDA code and run it through the hip and then actually have something that runs on this open GPU open whatever thing that AMD is going to release and so AMD has not actually implemented CUDA but they have made it to where that if you have CUDA source code you can just recompile it with a library. The library will translate your CUDA code into something that's not CUDA, so it doesn't have the proprietary tentacles around it. And then it will run on AMD hardware. But it'll run on AMD hardware with its massively higher compute operations per second. And so this, if this actually happens, AMD could leapfrog NVIDIA. The problem, I think, with this is that it, the release hasn't happened yet. It's January. And I think that AMD would have to have invested thousands of man years of development in making this happen. And so I think the first release for this is going to be very lacking. And hopefully the community will pick that up and run with it. But it remains to be seen if that will actually happen. Yeah, I think it's all going to be the community. And I also want to point out that right here toward the bottom of the article, they do mention that they plan to offer up OpenCL and Vulkan drivers for these things as well. So yay, but that's going to be something that comes in the future. Um, I'm I'm just I, that was I, I hope, yeah I, I hope we get plugins for you, you know I hope, hope hope the Unreal Engine starts working you know getting plugins for this I hope uh, you know we get some plugins for Unity Game Maker some of the other um, game development platforms out there just to make it easy for game developers to use this thing because that's really going to be the deciding factor other than the fact that like Wendell said we're going to have to obviously let the community tinker and play with this a little bit make it better add things uh, and and then put it re-upload their own repositories maybe even fork it i don't know uh just there make are, it better don't fork it there are already changes in the linux kernel at least as of kernel 4.2 mm -hmm. that are paving the way for this and paving the way for better even better compatibility between nvidia and amd and so i think this is really good that gives me hope that maybe amd has all their ducks in a row and their eyes dotted and their t's crossed in terms of executing this because the linux kernel infrastructure for these kinds of things for the modern driver support they have been working on like mad for the last couple of months and i believe the underlying like the foundational infrastructure because a lot of this requires linux kernel changes for the way that they want to implement it and especially with having everything run in what's called user space so that the it's running at the user level instead of the kernel level the kernel level being you know more permissive and the user level being sort of more flexible but a little bit more sandboxed um the the changes needed for that are already in the Linux kernel, a lot of them. And so I think kernel 4.2 and newer um, really have paved the way to make some of the things that AMD is pos promising actually possible. And so that gives me a flutter of hope that they may actually be able to pull this off. Well, regardless, we'll try to support this with our game if possible. You know, whatever we can do to, to help support it. So I don't know. 
Anyway, let's move on over and talk about Intel's speed step. Uh, or, I'm sorry, speed shift. I mean, speed step is something different entirely. Speed shift uh, tech. <laughs> uh, this is um, they have three really scalable mobile processors. This is pretty interesting. Uh, Wendell, you could probably say this more succinctly than we can, um, since we've just so come off a plane speed shift. And I'm all sleepy. It's a marketing term for yet another thing. Uh, you you guys may be familiar with P states on processors, basically power states. Uh, mm -hmm. Normally, those are controlled. Well, up until now, those have been controlled entirely by the operating system. The operating system decides what speed the CPU needs to run at, and that happens, and so on and so forth. Well, it turns out that changing P states actually takes a little while to happen. When a CPU ramps down to save power and, and then ramps back up again, um, it can take a while, you know, up to a tenth of a second to move through that. And that manifests on Intel hardware as a little bit of a delay or a little bit of latency. And so if you've ever used, you know, like a modern, uh, modern Apple iPad, one of the things that Apple has actually optimized really well in iOS is how responsive the touchscreen is. I mean, even Google has had trouble competing with this a little bit on the Android platform, where when you touch the screen, the thing responds immediately. People generally find that really well. <laughs> Windows being what Windows is and the architecture of Windows, <laughs> plus <laughs> the power management <laughs> stuff, plus all of the other stuff has meant that, you know, touch the touch experience on <laughs> portable computers and tablets, especially computers like the, the Surface Pro 3 and the, the Surface Pro 4 and the Surface Book, has not really been where it should be. And so now enter speed step and so there's really cool articles we got to give props to to uh, ryan at pc perspective and also anon tech uh, they've got some really good articles where they've done some really in-depth testing of this technology that's in skylake to where the processor actually controls its clock speed and power management and so it's it's hands off for the operating system there isn't nearly the overhead and so it's responding six seven eight times faster in terms of ramping up and ramping back down in terms of, of power savings and all this other stuff. The result is that when you touch the screen and the processor has to wake up and the computer has to respond to whatever it is that you're doing is that the computer actually does feel noticeably faster. And I've got the Surface Book, and so there's a review on the Surface Book, and I got the Threshold 2 update for Windows 10 when I was doing the testing for it. And holy crap, I did not, you know, it was like, oh yeah, oh, 30 milliseconds, big deal. Who cares? It's going to, you know, I mean, yeah, it's going to be a little bit better for battery life. I doubt any normal human being could actually tell the difference between that. Holy crap. Web browsing, like using Edge and using Chrome for uh, browsing the internet and moving around and, and that kind of thing, it was so different that I could actually pick it up on the camera. Just doing a 60 FPS recording with the, with the camera, just touching the screen and, and scrolling the windows in terms of like how fast that screen responded, it was noticeably different on camera. It was noticeably different for me. So yeah, this is a really interesting technology that's present in Skylake. And I, I can't believe that this is the, you know, sort of the first I've heard about it. I mean, I should have heard about this on launch day. This is sort of nuts, but this is really cool for portable computing. I guess long story short, now Windows users will will be as touchy as Apple users. <laughs> touchy feely. <laughs> Yeah, because you touch and then uh, you feel it. <laughs> All right, um, let's talk about some science stuff. Some pretty exciting, exciting things have been happening in Geneva. So some physicists have found another particle that could be, oh, like it could be one of two different things. It could be, I grab it. It could be not. Well, it could be one of three different things. It could be a fluke, and and then when they go back through their data, they're going to be like, oh, it was a false alarm. But it could be. A graviton, which would be ridiculous because that's the particle that gives gravity to things. You don't mm. understand the gravity of this situation. It could also be a heavier, the heavier, uh, I guess, version of the of the Higgs boson, because you know there's still some mass they have to account for there, and the, the Higgs boson is the thing that gives uh, everything mass. So it could be one of those two different things. Could be. It's heavy. Yeah. The most likely thing is that it's a coincidence, though. I'll just point that yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Way, the way most likely. <laughs> I want it to be a graviton. That's what I want. If I if I could like pay them for it to be anything, I could pay. I would pay them for it to be a graviton. Because then we'll finally be able to make that DeLorean fly. Just saying. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then we'll have to we'll, we'll have to create all kinds of other things to, to get it to all the other things. But at least it can fly. Hmm. When cars fly. Well, no, actually, the, the, I make comment about that. But the other thing about gravitons is that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but gravity has got a direct correlation to time and the time distortion. And if that's how I do, 
very, very badly reference Einstein's theory of relativity. Uh, but there's nothing energy, you can bend them together and all that kind of stuff? Well, yeah, so if you have... If we can control gravitons, we might be able to actually make the DeLorean go back in time. Just saying. When, and, please don't back me up on this. I, I just want, every once in a while, when I'm at like a, or when I'm, when I'm somewhere and they have like really good food, that's when I want a time machine the most. Because after I finish the sandwich, I'm like, I'm full. I'm going to go back in time and eat it again. <laughs> you don't even necessarily have to go back to the beginning. I mean, if you experienced it in reverse, it would probably still be as satisfying. If slightly hmm. weird. Well, that we I thought just that was to... vomiting. We... <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, that, that's, that's a different forward. experience because oh, we're still different. moving forward in time. Yeah. Yeah, not not hmm. uneating it. Yeah. I, Remember we just need to get a slider. Like egg on making itself or whatever. <laughs> you, you need to get a slider <laughs> that's like time code. You just could like rewind and you can just go back and forth. You're like, that's so amazing. I love this sandwich. I want to get a pocket version of that that can control certain people if, they, if you point at them. And just make this. If I, yeah, I, I want to. You just described an Adam Sandler movie. Just it, really? To, yeah. I'm just gonna point that out. And, oh, that yeah. Yeah. I never saw that movie because because it was an Adam Sandler movie. I, I never saw that movie because it, it's, <laughs> yeah. Speaking of flying cars, let's look at Terra Fugia. Is that how you say it? They, they, they so this is an American company uh, based in Massachusetts. And they have just been approved to do some tests on a flying car by the FAA. It's going to be a, a one-eighth or one-tenth scale model of their flying car. But essentially the idea here is that you can buy a flying car in like the next some so and so many years. Yeah, you drive around town, you get to the highway, and you just go whew, computerized, drop you off 400 miles away. Now the, the, the cool part about this is the, the flying part is completely automated so you don't have to worry about you know having a pilot's license i think that would have been the the main thing that worried me about flying cars is like oh sure that's what we need these same idiots that are driving around on these roads especially here in washington what's wrong with you guys um these same idiots that are driving around cutting each other off when they get in the air <laughs> it's just gonna be like it's gonna be population control is what it's gonna be and you're gonna have to pay five dollars to register and then you're gonna be published in some kind of a database somewhere Mm -hmm. You're also, because it's computer controlled, you're not going to be able to just make it fly whenever. You're going to have designated flying zones. So your uh, commutes are going to be, it might be automated, but you're going to have designated flying zones. Mm -hmm. And if your car is broken, you the, can just say, my fly is down. <laughs> <laughs> I was just mocking the FAA's ridiculous drone registration nonsense. Oh, oh yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's, yeah. This is okay, drones. Mm -hmm. so, no. so now what you're telling me is I have to register my... <laughs> Magnum PI model <laughs> helicopter that I've had since 1983. Is that what you're telling me? Because that's completely ridiculous. But it's not a drone. It's a model helicopter. No, it's it's a terrorist device. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. Look, if that one guy hadn't landed it in the White House lawn. Hey, 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 you know what? There's there's a database for people who have model helicopters. There's not a database for people who have machine guns. True. <laughs> what? Okay. Let's let's see if we can find a loophole. What if I, you know, I'm an I'm an American. It's my inalienable right to have a machine gun. What if I mount it on the helicopter? Then it's a it's not a helicopter. It's a mobile machine gun, and I have a right not to be on a list. I wonder if or I'll uh, shoot you. <laughs> well, no, because like if you manufacture your own firearms for your own personal use, you do not have to register them. That's perfectly fine. Right. I wonder if the same is true of a quad rotor. If you manufacture your own quad rotor for your own personal use, do you have to register it? Any lawyers in the audience want to comment? Because I might be in that boat. I might not. I'm not. I'm just saying. <laughs> he um, the firearm <laughs> part or the uh, drone he, part? He may or, be, may or may not be making, um, you know, um, stuff. Drill Giant press flag. Makarov 1911s or drones. <laughs> yeah. You don't know. You may or may not be making. <laughs> or neither. Things. I'm just saying. <laughs> in fact, he's he's uh, he's about 33 percent through. Um, building a Megatron in the basement. <laughs> True story. Been there. Seen it. Just yeah. need to get that Chinese voice recognition software and we'll be all set. <laughs> oh, man. This will help you build it. Uh, so there is a mother robot. Did we talk about this last week? I feel like we did. Maybe I just read it last week. I think we read it last week because we were in China in the middle of... I don't our... remember. Did we talk about this last week? No. Yeah, this if is we an did talk, article. if we did talk about this, it was like I don't know what's going on. I'm closing because we've talked about this before. It's an older article, but That's this August. could this, this yeah. is this is what we need. It could help us build what we're talking about right now. Anyway, 
Uh, this is a uh, so just coming back from China. The, the one of the takeaways for me in Wuhan was, holy shit, the pollution. And I really like China. It's one of my favorite places to go because of the food and the uh, you know I like the culture has they have lower egos, which I think is very uh, interesting to sit back and watch people cut each other off in traffic and not show any emotion. Just like, oh yeah, he needed to go there and I need to go there. So later on, I'll cut him off. I think I saw that once. I just saw no emotion like ever. Maybe but, it was just and, a horn honking, and I'm used to it. Yeah, anyway, the pollution in Wuhan is, God, it's like 10, 20 times worse than Beijing. Like, it's really bad. And a lot of it's because they just keep building and building and building and building. It's a dry area, and it's dust more than more than just, like, you know, emissions or smog or whatever. Dust. Large particles, which are the most harmful to breathe, just everywhere. And you, we, we didn't we didn't see the sky one time in Wuhan. Not once. I saw the sun like, Whoa. Is glowing. It's, it, yeah, it looks like the air. It's a cyberpunk thing where you look up and you just see like a glow coming from the sky, but you don't know if it's the sun or if it's a giant spaceship or something. They needed to upgrade their GPS is basically what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. When I looked out the window, I was like, dude, this this draw distance. Wow, look at that fog of war. They need a new GPU. Yeah. I was like, Wuhan <laughs> needs a new GPU bad. Well, this is what they're trying to do right now. They've got these mist cannons that uh, can clear, I think it's 100... Uh, about 100 meters, it'll be shooting mist, or 60 meters high. The, they can clear out certain areas, and they basically shoot them up into the air, and they join with a lot of the large particles, and then they just kind of rain down. And that gets the larger particles out of the air. And, you know, the small particles are one thing, but your your body is um, has a hard time with some of the larger particles. I, I don't know. The, the small ones are pretty dangerous, too. It's like the difference between dust getting caught in your air filter and a bunch of leaves hitting it. Yeah. So... So it's like artificial rain. Kind of. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the newer cities in China are, are pretty clean. It's some of these cities with all the legacy stuff. Yeah, that's what it looked like. Yeah, this is it. Wow. That's pretty much what it was like there. Just like that. Yep. Exactly like that. And I remember we were driving across the bridge and and the, the, the big cityscape was supposed to be like right there. And I was like, where's the city? There's no city. You can't see it. So we, I never actually got to see what the city looked like. Hopefully this will help. And, 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 you know, and they're also doing as many things. China is, it's weird because they are a country that has some of the worst pollution anywhere. China and India are really, really bad. But they're also, per capita, one of the greenest countries. They just have too many people. You know, when they have like a billion more than we do in the USA. So with that many people, the per capita doesn't matter as much. I think they're just behind Germany uh, and possibly some of the Scandinavian countries for energy efficiency. So, anyway. See, so it looks like they're actually using these for part of it's that, and part of it's to maintain, uh, like like I said, when, you, when you're doing a lot of construction, there's a lot of mm-hmm. dust that gets kicked up. Well, you put them right there to stop it from spreading and from, through from the wind. kicking yeah. up to begin with. Because a lot of what I was tasting in the air in, in Wuhan was, it really tasted like construction dust. Not so much um, like like smog, but like actual sediment that was being kicked up from like the destruction of a building or or a mm-hmm. carving up of a street it was really gross so anyway i hope they get that stuff uh figured out because i do like going over there it's cool but you know i wouldn't want to stay for too long without a pretty nice mask all right well they're trying something that's good all right so this next article is uh, talking about laser armed fighter jets by 2020 <laughs> this is an interesting chunk of technology that i'm i'm Kind of stoked about, and at the same time, it kind of creeps me out. Well, they, they conjure because, up an image first. Well, th- these, you know, we, we think of lasers, we think of, you know, we think of Star Wars, we think of, you know, phasers coming off of the spaceships in, in Star Trek, we think of... We uh, think of pew-pew. Yeah. But these the things... chairs at each other? Yeah, if you notice, if you look at these, all of the video of the oh. actual, like, laser hitting something... Um, it's not... It's a heat cannon. Yeah, it's it's not invisible light spectrum. We're taking heat literally. I, the other thing that's interesting about this is, is they're, they're mostly targeting this for defensive purposes. So they'll have a, a, maybe a, a gunboat or something, a gunship or whatever fly, flying around. And it'll have a few different, I guess, laser turrets that'll essentially create a heat shield around the... Uh, you know, and as long as there's fuel, it'll be there because they need a lot of power for this. So it'll have to have extra fuel... But if, if like a missile or another, uh, you, you know, um, another craft or device, drone or even airplane gets gets close, it'll be disabled by the heat. Well, and I, I think you're 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 misinterpreting the, the 
well, the article is not painting the best picture. Basically, what you'd end up having is several of these laser-mounted turrets. Right. And as a something comes close, they will detect that there's an object nearby, and, just and they it. will target it and roast it. So you get a missile coming inbound; it'll blast it way, way off away from the uh, you know the aircraft. Or you get close enough to another plane, you could just take it out. Take it out by just flying near it. So that whole uh, Top Gun scene when he's inverted, he's like, hi, flipping the finger, bam, blast it out of the sky with his laser defense turrets. I mean, that would be crazy. But, you know, a lot of this stuff, it's, it's not visible light. So you could have this thing sitting up on a mountain if it had a big enough of a, a you know, a, a targeting dish that could have a decent range. You could just start carving out things in woods and no one would know it. Why is this tree catching on fire all the time? I don't know. The other thing they're going to have to look fiction. at with this. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, good. Well, I, science fiction has convinced me that uh, once you get to a certain point with lasers, the Air Force no longer matters. And so I was really surprised to see that, you know, the, the R&D goal here is to put a bunch of lasers on planes because once that laser technology exists, you can take planes out really quick because the whole speed of light thing means that if somebody's going to turn on, you know, the, the 400 megawatt laser on the on the plane and melt it out of the sky... You're not going to know until your plane is already absorbing the energy, which is probably bad. I feel like there may be some treaties in place that are preventing the use of things like that. Because there's, there's already some, some you know, war treaties out there that say like, okay, you guys are not allowed to use light or lasers to blind. You can't blind people. That's not, not allowed. There's all these weird rules. I, I'm always, war, war and rules never made sense to like how those go together. Maybe not killing each other would be the only rule I would have be like we just like have giant robots fight it out and whoever wins wins like battle tech style that'd be the only thing i would condone except then the robots become sentient and then they just say why are we killing each other and then like let's kill the people telling us to kill each other and then they take over and we probably have a peaceful society of robots of, oh yeah they we're robots. all in a power plant i'm gonna go matrix on this instead of skynet we're, we're gonna go full on we're all power plants very peaceful you know <laughs> we're all asleep interesting all right, shall we talk about some game stuff? Some more game stuff? I'm all about more game yeah. stuff. Uh, there's a new emulator out called... Uh, did I miss anything? That's pretty much it. New emulator out called uh, New Simu. And oh, it's just Simu. But um, it's it's the new version. It's it's doing a good job at running Mario Kart. So this will be, I guess, a, a dolphin simulator working with Wii, Wii games and stuff. Play, would you? No, it doesn't want to play. But if, you, if you're into emulation and that sort of thing, you may want to check this one out as an alternative... Um, and remember, folks, buy the game at the store and use your disc copy to play the game on your emulated hardware, which only violates half of the rules. Yeah, and if you can't figure out how to rip it, we didn't, we're not going to tell you how to rip the game or anything like that. Just make sure you have a copy of the game. I, I played Zelda on my PC, but I went out and bought a copy of the game because that's what you do. And plus, I've, I've made a video about it. So... Of course, they're going to look at me and scrutinize me more. Hmm. So that's why if they ever show up knocking, I'll be like, got the games right here. You want to go to court and talk about this for years? And they'll be like, we'll just bury you in paperwork. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to set the paperwork on fire. Anyway, the last thing I wanted to mention here as far as games go, uh, Under Rail has been released as of about today-ish. This is pretty awesome. I saw this. I was like, yes, finally! Now, Under Rail is a game that is very similar to Fallout 1 and 2. Except the story and the characters are not nearly as quirky. Story's not as big. But where it excels is exploration and um, uh, combat. It's a, probably better combat than Fallout 1 and 2. But Fallout, uh, the newer versions are basically, you know, Skyrim with guns or whatever. They're, they're not at very... The only way that they're true to the originals is the setting. And even that's been... Uh, they've even taken some license with that. So if you want... A more uh, Fallout original Fallout experience. You might want to check this out. It's a cool game. I've been playing the uh, one of the earlier the uh, alpha releases, or the Alpha. I mean, it's actually, I was really impressed with it. I thought it was pretty fun. Hmm. So yeah, I'm looking forward to jumping in and playing some more of this one. It'll be the next time we do Waz. It'll be like the game that I'm playing. We should do Waz. Yeah, mm -hmm. this will be the game that I've been playing a lot. So guys, again, thanks very much for all your support. Uh, can't do this stuff without you. We're going to have more original content coming up. Lots of tutorials. We've got a whole series of camera tutorials coming up. I've got some audio creation tutorials coming up. Uh, Windows got some stuff coming up. You know, we've just, we're just going to do a lot. Oh, and we have a whole slew of Linux videos in the pipe. And now that I'm back in town, I can actually 
sit down and, and uh, some, a lot of these have already been shot. We just have to sit down and organize them and figure out when they're going to go live. So, yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. We're great at content creation. We're just not really great at content we've, production. We've got to get like <laughs> one more production person. And we will after the beginning of the year when things are not as chaotic. It's so chaotic right now. Yeah. So, yeah. I All haven't right. slept in my own bed in a month. Mm-hmm. Uh, any more any more updates from you that people should be looking forward to, Wendell? I did the Surface Book review, which is really interesting. You should totally check that out on the Hardware Channel. Um, oh, I got a question, question uh, for you while you're on here. We, we we got we picked up one of the Asus Transformers, one of the fancy ones with the 1440p display. Yeah, it's the uh, mm -hmm. it's the Transformer Book uh, Chi. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you guys want to see a video on that, it's yeah. it's going to be a little similar to the Windows uh, book because it has Windows on it. But I might we might try to install Linux on it. I don't know. I, I've at this point, I don't know if I like it or not because it's too big to be a tablet, and it's at a size and a price point that are a little bit higher than I would like. I, I would probably just buy a small laptop because you can't yeah, honestly, play. Honestly, for I, Linux, I don't know. The XPS 13 from Dell is is really hard to beat, but it's not. It mm -hmm. doesn't have all the the whiz bang stuff. But honestly, I don't really use the whiz bang stuff anyway. The touch screen and all that business. So I, I don't know exactly how I feel about it. So I'll, I can come at it from that perspective and try to figure out if I like it or not after using it for a while. I mean, it's not really supposed to be like a, a laptop replacement, but it's definitely a competitor with the, the Microsoft Surface. Yeah, I don't exactly know what it is in the market. Like, what is this? It's, well, it's kind of like when the phablets started coming out. I'm like, what are these? They're not exactly tablets, but they're too big to be a phone. What is this? I and think, who is it for? I think the Transformer book is like the Core M, and the Pro 4 and certainly the Surface book are much higher in. The Surface book is about multimedia production actually uh the next time we get together you probably should give the surface book a try because mm -hmm. it is unbelievably fast for what it is in the adobe creative suite and it will absolutely run circles around or, around the chi in 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 creative productivity because it's got the nvidia gpu gddr5 and the full acceleration and it shows up like as if it's a uh you know, with all the acceleration and all the options and editing 4K video actually works really well. How, and, how much uh, was that one in comparison? I mean, this one, we we grabbed this one in Hong like, Kong for under 800 uh, US Yeah, it's dollars. like three grand. Oh. Yeah, now see, uh, yeah. Not, I'm sorry, I misspoke. <laughs> I wasn't mentioning the Surface Pro, uh, Surface Pro, not the Surface Book. And that, that Surface Pro, uh, the one that I used when I was, I was down there last, is more of a direct comparison to this one. But this one is definitely cheaper. And it's got a, you know, it's it's cool. Anyway, we'll, we'll talk more about yeah. it. I, I'm, I'm we're gonna do it. I'm like, screw it. We're gonna you, do it. You're gonna do it. I'm gonna right. make a video about this thing because I think it's kind of neat. And I, I may just, I may come down and uh, me and Wendell might just sit down and be like, okay, Surface versus the Transformer. Maybe. I, I uh, really, I've got 16 gigabytes of RAM and 3.6 gigahertz. So bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, two gigahertz dual core. Oh. I've got a pen. Yeah, you got I've a stylus. Got I've almost got Linux working on it, but when I eject the screen, there's kernel panics to be had. <laughs> oh, that's a All right, well, that's pretty much it, guys. Uh, I'm going to go edit this right now, so I've, I've got to go. I'm sorry, there's no ending. <laughs>